Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and this is Cindy Oliver and she's a dog. This is another video in our series on logical fallacies and I must say it is something that I have been seeing a lot of recently. In this video we will be covering the post hoc fallacy. Now post hoc is short for post hoc ergo propter hoc which is Latin for after this therefore because of this. So essentially the post hoc fallacy occurs when people assume that just because an event occurs after another event the first event must have caused the second event. Cindy is sometimes guilty of this. At night time she occasionally thinks she can see a dog on the other side of the glass door and she barks at it. I then open the door and the dog is gone. Cindy assumes the dog ran away because she barked at it but she is actually committing the post hoc fallacy. Although the dog disappeared after she barked at it, her barking wasn't what actually caused the dog to disappear. The dog disappeared because it was only her reflection and so it disappeared once the door was opened. A slightly more well-known example of the post hoc fallacy concerns former Brazilian football player Pele. He blamed a dip in his playing performance on having given a fan a specific playing shirt. His play recovered after a friend got his shirt back for him. However, his friend didn't really get the shirt back. He just told him he had. So the improvement in his playing performance couldn't possibly have been related to the shirt. The post hoc fallacy also often occurs in people who have either taken medications or received other types of treatments. And here it is known as either the placebo or nocebo effect. A uh, placebo effect is when you falsely attribute a good outcome to a therapy when in fact it was just going to happen anyway. And a uh, nocebo effect is when you falsely attribute a bad outcome to a therapy. Now, a lot of people think that placebo and nocebo effects are all about the power of the mind and that therapies can work or cause side effects because you think they are going to. Although this can sometimes be the case, particularly for subjective symptoms, it is just as likely that the person was going to get better or going to get sick anyway, and the treatment was just a coincidence. And it's because of the placebo effect that new treatments are evaluated using randomised, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trials. What happens in a randomised controlled double-blinded trial is people are randomly assigned to one of two groups. And this randomization step is critical because without it, you don't know whether your two groups have differences that will affect their outcome. One group is given the treatment and the other group is given a tablet or whatever that looks identical to the treatment but doesn't actually contain any medication, otherwise known as a placebo. Importantly, neither the patient nor the person administering or evaluating the treatment knows who is getting the active treatment and who is getting the placebo. You then compare the results of the two groups and see if there is a difference. Now, of course, if there is already an effective treatment available for a condition, it would be unethical to just give people placebos. So in these situations, you either use the existing treatment as a comparator or you can give both groups the existing treatment in addition to either placebo or the new treatment. An area where there is often a large placebo effect is in treatments for pain. And a pain treatment that has been getting a lot of media attention recently is medical cannabis. And of course, lots of people are tested how their pain has been relieved by medical cannabis. But is that really the case or are they inadvertently falling prey? 
to the post hoc fallacy. In this study, they conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis of randomised controlled trials in which cannabis was compared with a placebo for the treatment of clinical pain. They specifically included studies that compared the change in pain intensity before and after treatment. And they looked at 20 studies involving almost 1,500 people. In this forest plot here, they look just at the effect on pain intensity of the placebos used in the trials. And for those of you who aren't familiar with forest plots, the squares represent different studies. And if they are to the right of the vertical line, it means the study showed that there was a reduction in pain with placebo. And if the confidence interval is also to the right of the vertical line, it means that the reduction was statistically significant. And the confidence interval is the horizontal line that you can see on either side of the box. The diamond down the bottom is the combined effect of all the trials. And as you can see, it is to the right of the vertical line, which means that pain was rated as being significantly less intense after treatment with a placebo. The study authors also found that there was no significant difference between cannabis and a placebo for reducing pain. So what this means is that most people who experience pain relief from cannabis are just experiencing a placebo effect. As I mentioned, the other example of the post hoc fallacy in relation to treatments is the nocebo effect. And one place this is seen a lot is with vaccines. You knew I was going to mention vaccines, didn't you? Many people assume any adverse event that occurs after a vaccine is caused by the vaccine. Sometimes they will be right, but often they will be wrong because people suffer adverse events all the time. So often they will occur after a vaccine purely by chance. Now, we previously discussed randomised placebo-controlled double-blind clinical trials. In addition to assessing the efficacy of a product, they also assess whether the product causes any side effects by comparing any adverse events that occur in the treatment group with any adverse events that occur in the placebo group. This study here is a systematic review and meta-analysis of 12 different studies that were completed for COVID vaccines. And what they did in this study was they specifically looked at adverse events that occurred in the placebo groups of each study compared with adverse events that occurred in the treatment groups. This figure here summarises the findings of the review. The chart on the left shows systemic adverse events after the first dose. And the chart on the right shows adverse events after the second dose. The orange squares are for the vaccine group and the blue squares are for the placebo group. And the adverse events that we are talking about in this study are non-serious adverse events, things like headache and fatigue. Now, two things are apparent when you look at the data. The first is that adverse events are more likely to occur after the second dose than after the first dose in the vaccine group. The second thing is that there is still a significant number of adverse events that actually occur in the placebo group. And overall, about 30% of participants experience an adverse event after receiving a placebo. And what this means is even if you get a common adverse event after a vaccine, it doesn't necessarily mean it was caused by the vaccine. It certainly could have been caused by the vaccine because particularly after the second dose, the incidence of systemic adverse events is definitely higher in the vaccine group, but it could also just be a coincidence and an example of the post hoc fallacy. But the post hoc fallacy doesn't just happen with minor adverse events occurring after vaccination. 
It can also happen with more serious adverse events with people assuming that if they've developed a serious condition after a vaccine, the vaccine must be the cause. Now, of course, there are some rare adverse events that are linked to vaccines, but not everything that happens after a vaccine is caused by it. In the recent past, one vaccine where this happened was the HPV vaccine. Now, the HPV vaccine provides protection against cancers caused by the HPV virus, including mouth, throat and genital cancers. And in particular, it provides 90% protection against cervical cancer. It's now given to both boys and girls, but it was initially given to girls. And it was quite controversial because it was protecting against a sexually transmitted disease. So some parents assumed that it would result in their daughters becoming wildly sexually promiscuous, which is another logical fallacy, but that's for another day. But another reason why a lot of parents refused to let their children get the vaccine was because they had concerns about the safety of the vaccine. And if we look specifically at the US, from 2015 to 2018, there was a 79.9% increase in the proportion of parents who refused the HPV vaccine for their children owing to safety concerns. And one of the reasons that parents were concerned about vaccine safety was because they'd heard stories of vaccine harms from both social and traditional media, as well as from conversations with friends. Now, some of the stories that they heard would have just been anti-vaxxers making stuff up because they like to do that. But in some cases, the stories would have come from people who genuinely believe they had suffered vaccine harms because they are not familiar with the post hoc fallacy and inadvertently attributed an adverse event that was a coincidence to being an event caused by the vaccine. Now, I'm sure right now some of you are swearing at me and saying, how do you know that their conditions aren't caused by the vaccine, you evil person? And that is a good question. And we're going to look at it now. Now, serious adverse events were evaluated as part of the original clinical trials and there was no difference between the vaccine group and the control group. But we do know that really rare adverse events won't necessarily be picked up in clinical trials because the trials just aren't large enough to see them. They will be picked up, however, in post-marketing surveillance studies. And this is one such study which was undertaken in Denmark. Now, if an adverse event is caused by a vaccine, the rate of that adverse event should be higher in vaccinated people than in unvaccinated people. If it's the same, it means that there is no link. Now, there are a number of different methods of determining if there is a difference between rates in vaccinated and unvaccinated people. And in this study, they actually used three methods just to be really sure. The first thing they did was a cohort study where they compared the rate of events in 314,017 girls who had been vaccinated with a matched cohort who hadn't been vaccinated. The next thing they did was a self-controlled case series analysis where they just looked at 11,817 girls who had ex experienced one of the events they were interested in and compared the number of events that occurred before vaccination with the number of events that occurred after vaccination. Finally, they did a population time trend analysis where they looked at general trends in events between 2000 and 2014 and whether the introduction of the vaccine in 2009 had any effect on the trend. 
And the events that they looked at were uh, first hospital contact with abdominal pain, non-specific pain, headache, malaise or fatigue, including chronic fatigue syndrome, tachycardia, which is a rapid beating heart, including POTS, and hypertension, and that hypertension is low blood pressure, or syncope, which is fainting. And these were chosen because they were events that had been reported as adverse events following vaccination. And they also looked at events that weren't reported following vaccination as a control. So what did they find? Let's have a look. And this is directly from the study. We found no increased rates of hospital records related to pain, fatigue or circulatory symptoms in girls exposed to HPV vaccine versus unexposed girls. Similarly, when girls with such records served as their own controls, no association was observed for HPV vaccination. Furthermore, at the Danish population level, Rates of these hospital records steadily increased over time in both girls and boys, unrelated to the timing of introduction of HPV vaccination. In other words, although a number of girls have experienced various medical conditions following the HPV vaccination, these conditions are not caused by the vaccine and would still have occurred if they hadn't been vaccinated. And this isn't just shown in the study that we just discussed. A large number of other studies have found the same thing. And the same goes for other vaccines. So in summary, just because one event follows another event, it doesn't mean that the first event caused the second event. So if you see anyone committing the post hoc fallacy, please share this video with them. If you'd like to look further into the data I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And please remember this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. If you've got this far, thank you for listening. And if you've liked, shared or commented on the video, double thank you because that helps the algorithm and means that more people will see the video. And of course, thank you to everyone who has bought me a coffee or little Cindy here a treat. We really appreciate your support. We have more videos coming up about logical fallacies. So if you'd like to see them, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.